This is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we look at the uh, book of Job in our survey of the Old Testament. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege, the opportunity, even the pleasure of studying your word today. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Job looks like the word job, but it is Job. Let's look at the purposes of the book. We have them up on your screen to get a better understanding of God's justice. Two, to be aware that there is an unseen conflict that could better explain what goes on in the visible world. Three, to show that God tests his most faithful servants for unknown reasons to those servants. The major themes, <clears throat> the retribution principle, wisdom, justice, and the sovereignty of God, and mediator. God's presence, a little different this time, God's presence is not manifested in this book in any special way. Though at the end, God is present for the final discourses of the book. Discourses, you might call them speeches. <clears throat> Let's look at the outline. It's kind of important to look at the outline because this really helps you understand what's going on. It begins with the prologue that introduces us to Job. Um, God and Satan are having a discussion. If you haven't read the book yet, you should read at least the first couple of chapters as soon as you can. That'll tell you what's going on. Then you get into these dialogues, these conversations. Job begins to talk about the pain he's going through. It's chapter 3. And then he has these friends come up to him and talk to him about his situation. We sell Eliphaz. Job responds. Bildad. Job responds again. So far, Job responds again. <clears throat> and then we go through another cycle of these dialogues, Eliphaz, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, Job. Then finally, they start to act accusing Job, Eliphaz, Job responds, Bildad, Job responds. Well, it gets interesting. At this point, we have a hymn to wisdom. Wisdom is a key to understanding this book. We go another list of discourses, this one by Job, and then Elihu. Now, we haven't seen Elihu, Elihu yet, but he is an advanced student, you might say, of wisdom. He's not an older person, he's a younger person. He has some things to say. He talks about Job, the offense of Job, and then a closing statement and summary, a summary. And then the very end of the book, towards the end of it, chapter 38 starts talking, God starts talking and explaining things. He gives a couple of speeches. Job has some closing statements, and then we have the final words in what we call the epilogue. The book of Job addresses some of the biggest questions of human history. This is one reason it's really interesting. The book offers some divine insight as to one cause for the righteous to suffer. The righteous do suffer in this world. It does not seek to explain the reason other than for one to accept that the reason lies in God's wisdom and sovereignty. It's an important lesson. Who wrote the book? Well, it was not written by Job or his friends. Some think maybe Moses. 
it was written by an Israelite. We see this in the use of the covenant name only at the beginning in the prologue, when God is speaking in the divine discourses, and the epilogue at the end. In the rest of the book, the divine name Yahweh, remember that's usually translated the four capital letters, L-O-R-D, only appears once. That's mentioned by Job in 12.9. So what we have here is a book that rarely mentions Yahweh, especially in the main part of the book. Now, look at this next sentence starting right here. Not frequently using the divine name is a strong indicator that they are not under the covenant. So, what they is, is Job and his friends. The author would have had access to oral or written sources. The prologue would have been divinely revealed to him since only God could know these things. Now, the prologue is where God and Satan are having a discussion. Uh, God would relate that to us through a prophet or an oracle to someone who wrote the book. The author also preserves much of the non-Israelite character of the language. So when these guys talked, they didn't talk like Israelites. And that would be Job and his friends. So basically what this says is, we don't know who the author is, but he was a Israelite. All right? And he would have got his information from passed on verbal or oral tradition or written sources. It's writing. There's been some challenges by scholars on this book in many ways. There almost always is in every book of the Bible. There's no reason to question that the book of Job was written to be presented in any other way than it is. It was not a collection of writings put together, but was from the start a single literary composition. In other words, this isn't a bunch of different speeches with different people about different things and someone compile it together and make it a nice story. That's not what happened. Next paragraph. The book may have been written centuries after the actual event. Hundreds of years later, after Job went through this. It should also be understood that it was not a word-for-word -word transcript. You rarely have that in Scripture. In fact, I don't think you hardly ever have it. Uh, you don't see it in the Gospels, hardly at all. Rather, it is written to present it as, a, as wisdom literature and is to be interpreted as such. So it's written as wisdom literature. Man, we talked about that in our introduction. Though I have said that Old Testament wisdom is rooted in the Mosaic Law, Job may be the one exception. Now see, here's the thing. Job is called a wisdom book, and it is a wisdom book, no question about it, but not straight out of Old Testament. Because, I mentioned earlier, they didn't have the law yet. So this would be the exception, but we can't completely prove it because we just don't have the, the dates or someone who can give us a date like a when a king reigned or something like that. We do see principles of morality within the book, but there is no mention of law or covenant. We see a basic understanding of justice and morality even in those days, but we know just from the fact that we are humans that God has given us an inside gauge, you might call it, for morality. So we can even see those outside Israel in the old, old days had some sense of morality. Now, as far as dating the actual events of Job, there's evidence in that this story of Job occurred after, or excuse me, about the time of the patriarchs. Now the patriarchs, you remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're talking around 2000 BC. Here's how we say this. Here's our evidence. Here's why we say this. One, there is no indication that Job is an Israelite, but rather an Edomite, since he is from Uz. That's in 1 1. We're not sure where Uz is, though, but we suspect it's near or in the area of Edom. Now, Edom, if you recall, is east of Israel on the other side of the Jordan. The lack of mention of Yahweh and the more frequent mention of El Shaddai 
points to the fact that this happened later on. Excuse me, that the, the dating of the events happened much earlier. Because the time you get to the later books, they have Yahweh in there a lot. But this does not have it hardly at all. Not in their discussions. And again, point three, there is no mention of the covenant of the law. So we would assume it's before the covenant of the law, which would put it before Moses. Around, It would put it earlier than 1440 B.C. Another interesting thing, Job lived to be in the age range of the patriarchs, 140 years. Remember they lived about that long, Abraham? And, and uh, he also lived a similar lifestyle. He had all these uh, livestock, big family, wealth. And then we have number five, a point of history. There's the mention of the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans roving around which also points to earlier time periods. So this is a early groups. The Chaldeans became the Babylonians. Sabians, I think, are down there in Arabia. So their mention is ro roaming around. You just don't see that in the later books. So this is one of, these are the reasons we think this took place very early. Other than this, there is nothing historical in the book to determine a more precise time of the events, but that it is generally true of wisdom literature. Wisdom literature doesn't give us a lot of historical events to place it. It just gives us the wisdom. It's not like the kings. It's not like uh, so many of the books, like the prophets. They'll mention a king that they might have prophesied under, or that king did this or that, and they can, and we can date it that way. But we don't have anything like that in the book of Job. So here's what we conclude. It would not be a problem to see it written well after the event either. So though what happened during the patriarchs, it could have been, been written much later. That's where you see those things written by the author that indicates the covenant was on, the name of the Lord was on, uh, being used at that time. So here's a quick summary. It was the event, let's put it that way, when this all happened, the story of Job probably happened around the time of Abraham or before. Not long before, I wouldn't think. But it wasn't written until much later, probably during the time of the kings, several hundred years later. In fact, about a thousand years later. It's translation. That's just a point, an academic point. It's difficult to translate because it is not the usual Hebrew. You've got these different, remember, non-Hebrews talking. So you've got words there that aren't normal, what we'd normally see at the Hebrew, though it is written in Hebrew. But it is not the kind of Hebrew we're used to in other places. It has many unusual words and styles, style rather, for this reason, translations vary widely, even the LXX. Now, the LXX, those Roman numerals represent the 70, or what we call the Septuagint. The Septuagint was a translation of the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek. Did you get that? The Septuagint was a translation of the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek, so it's a Greek old it's a it's a Greek Old Testament, and that was written oh uh, maybe a couple hundred years before Christ. All right. So, what we're saying is is that some of the words and lines are so difficult to translate. Even the men who translated the Septuagint did not translate some four hundred lines probably because they didn't know what they meant. They don't want to mislead, pe mislead people, so they leave them out. Let's talk about the background. Well, here, remember, we're talking about wisdom literature. We do not have any historical background, but we can look at the literary genres. Now, literary genres, the type of, uh, uh, type of style in which it's written, like poetry or prophecy, or prose, right? 
there are several different genres in Job. Dialogue, chapters 4 through 27. Soliloquy, that's when a person basically talks out loud about what he's thinking. Discourse, 29 through 41. Narrative, that's the beginning, 1 and 2. And that hymn we mentioned. It's rare for so many styles to be mixed like this, showing the book to have a level of sophistication in writing. <clears throat> of course, you know sophistication means it's, it's, a, it's a high and more difficult way of doing things. Like you might, well, let's go to something you might see in a movie. You might go to England, one of those big old mansions, and you have a butler answer the door. And he's very fancy, very dressed up, talks a certain ways. That's sophistication. Well, you come to my house, and I'm liable to answer the door. And I'm liable to be in my gym shorts. You see, that's not too sophisticated. One of the things that sets Job apart is this level of sophistication with numerous genres, while written in a skillful manner. Now, this next part's kind of interesting. I just want you to be a little familiar with it. A lot of this I don't expect you to remember, but it gives you some background. That's what we do with the book of Job. You read the book, and I must tell you, it's a very difficult read. But you can get the gist of the story. When I say gist, you can get the basic idea what's going on. Let's talk about wisdom in the ancient world. As we saw in our lesson before, this is our lesson before Job, wisdom literature was not uncommon in the ancient world outside of Israel. We have examples in Sumerian, one called the Atman and his God, that's 2000 BC, Akkadian, Ludleo Bel Nemiki, 2000 to 1000 BC, and we have one from Babylon, 1000 BC. Now we have many of these writings, but I wanted to cite you one example of ancient wisdom outside the Bible. Now, understand, these people are not believers, but they're basing their wisdom upon observation, what they've seen in life. And you can see some similarities. This is from a section called the Babylonia Theodicy. So this has been written probably around the time of David. Suffer 7, that's the subtitle, 72, line 72. In my youth I sought the will of my God, with prostration and prayer, I followed my goddess. You can see right there, they're not believers. But I was bearing a profitless corvée as a yoke. That's a way of saying, I think corvée means he's not getting paid what he should have. So he's not having, he doesn't have any money. My God decreed instead of wealth, destitution. You know, destitution means you're really poor. You're down and out. A cripple is my superior. A lunatic, crazy person, outstrips me. The rogue has been promoted, but I have been brought low. So this man is out of money. It looks like he has a, a cripple for a boss. By that, he's probably making fun of him. Uh, a lunatic outstrips me, outstrips me. He's crazy. The rogue has no control. He's basically running around. And it looks like he's been brought low. Then we have a comment by a friend, oh wise one. Notice a friend, we have that in Job too. We have the one who's suffering and then a friend comments. Here's what the friend says, oh wise one, oh savant who masters knowledge. In your anguish you blaspheme the God. See what he says? You're going against the God. That's why you're so miserable. The divine mind like the center of the heavens is remote. You can't understand God. The God, not the God of the Bible, but the God Knowledge of it is difficult. The masses do not know it. So the idea is that this man is suffering because he's blasphemed God. And he really doesn't understand the mind of God. It's like in the center of the heavens. You can't reach it. Now this is a similar thing that's going on in the book of Job. Because Job is suffering and his friends come, at, come up and comment about it. Well, let's look at the purpose and message. The purpose of Job is to, ex to examine God's policies on justice, especially concerning the righteous sufferer. Now, if you don't know this yet, Job begins 
the book of Job begins describing him as a righteous man. He lives right before God. He obeys God, but yet he goes through this terrible suffering. And that raises a question. Why would God make his righteous people suffer? That's the big question. Well, the answers begin. Let's start verse or chapter or <laughs> paragraph two. We see this go in two ways. First is what Satan suggests. That when God keeps blessing someone, the person blessed does not develop righteousness. Satan would claim that people are righteous for the blessing. Satan thinks he can prove this by God cutting off the righteous person's blessing. Satan challenges God's system. In other words, Satan claims people stay righteous because they're blessed. Take away the blessing and they will not be righteous. Do you get that? So Satan's proposal is you take away all this blessing from Job and God, he'll probably curse you. As God's going to show him that's not true. The second direction is that of Job. Job wonders how God can cause the righteous to suffer. Job is at a loss in trying to understand what God is doing. You see, Job is suffering. He doesn't understand it because he lives a righteous life. Now we'll We'll get into more why he felt this way in a few moments. So the question is, so God's justice and policies are examined. Is God fair? The book of Job goes at lengths to show that God is just and fair even when the righteous suffer. It offers various explanations for Job's suffering. You get that from his friends, by the way but mostly from the traditional view that good people are blessed and bad people suffer. Now, don't miss that. The traditional view is that good people are blessed and bad people suffer. The audience reads along knowing that Job is righteous and the reason he is suffering. You see, you find out why he's suffering at the very beginning of the book. In the end, we learn that though we may suffer, we may not know the reason. But God is perfect in his application of justice and is always fair. God's integrity and policy of blessing remains intact. We also learn that God's blessing, a righteous person, does not hinder the righteous person's developing further righteousness. You know, this is like saying, let me, let me just give you an illustration. It's Christmas time. And you've been a pretty good kid and your parents, you know what? They give you something, whether you've been good or bad, wouldn't they? Oh, well, this is kind of what this is saying. You're not good because you get presents, but you're good because that is what you wanted to be. And then you get presents. Now this does say it's really up to God who he blesses and why. The world is not so simple. There is an unseen conflict that is taking place that may cause things to stray from the norm. By that I mean, we know from early in the book that Satan is challenging God and God is going to use Job as a way to show Satan something. We also learn that God's wisdom is far above ours. Let's pause for a moment. Let me just explain something here. If parents are listening, you might want to for sure go through this book with your children. It is a difficult read in some portions, and just explain it to them. Uh, if they got a good uh, Bible with good footnotes, that'll help. But it can get pretty tedious, difficult for any child to read some of these things, even for adults. So, uh, don't worry about trying to grasp all these lines. You say, you wonder what that means. I wonder what that means. Just get the idea of what's going on. These guys are trying to tell Job why suffering. That goes on for several chapters. And Job's sitting there saying, wait a minute. I have not been unrighteous. I have been righteous. So that's the big deal. See, that's what's going on. 
All right, now let's kind of just go through the book uh, this way in a discussion. We do this in the structure and organization. Remember the prologue is the first couple of chapters. The prologue sets the scene and introduces the characters. The audience is informed with certain details that the characters are not. In other words, Job doesn't know what's going on in heaven. Neither does his friends. So, the audience is informed of certain details that the characters are not, such as the discussion between the Lord and Satan. This enables the audience, those who, are, who already know this part of the story, to see where Job's friends are wrong regarding Job. The prologue also introduces the issues at hand between God and Satan. Then we see the ruin of Job's family, his possessions, and health. The structure, Job's lament in chapter 3. When you get to chapter 3, you hear Job's cry. This introduces the three cycles of dialogues that carry on from chapters 4 through 27. So here it comes his friends. As the dialogue progresses, the friends become more antagonistic. Now that means they kind of oppose his thinking. Stronger and stronger. <clears throat> towards Job. While Job isolates himself and directs himself towards God. He's going to God while these guys are going to him. Going to Job. What Job's friends say is the traditional theology of the day. And here's the traditional theology. Now don't miss this. In fact, I'm going to highlight it in blue. Here's what most people thought. One suffers or prospers according to his conduct before God. This is known as the retribution principle. Don't miss that. The retribution principle. <clears throat> we'll come back to that later. Related to this principle, that is that the righteous prosper and the wicked suffer. The righteous prosper and the wicked suffer. The natural conclusion would be that Job must have done something wicked for him to suffer so much. Next paragraph. What many fail to see who adopt this retribution principle, those who believe it, is that God has in his own infinite wisdom ways of doing things that are not so simple as the principle seems. God holds to the principle but how does but how he does so is not always clear <clears throat> there are times when your parents might seem very unfair but what you don't know is is what they know they may stop you from going out and doing an activity that they know is dangerous or can lead to something dangerous and you don't believe it because they have greater wisdom they might have done it themselves. They might not tell you about it, but they might have made that same dumb mistake that you're about to make. Next paragraph. <clears throat> As the dialogue continues, Job agrees with what his friends conclude about the principle of retribution. It is interesting that in chapter 21, Job himself points out an exception to the principle regarding the wicked and that sometimes the wicked do prosper. So Job recognizes, you know, the principle is true, but there seems to be exceptions because wicked people do prosper. That raises the question that if there is an exception for the wicked, there could be one for the righteous. But Job does not go that direction in claiming the second exception towards himself. In other words, Job doesn't say, well, the wicked be prosperous, so I guess it's okay for the righteous to suffer. Job doesn't go that direction. He doesn't discuss that part. He sees himself as righteous and begins to question with suspicion God's justice. You know, had he went that direction, understanding there's exceptions, he might have handled this a lot better. But he begins to wonder about God's justice. Maybe he doesn't understand God's justice now. Maybe he's misreading it. Maybe God doesn't completely understand his heart. Well, we know better than that. Next line, Job's speeches reject his friend's conclusion about himself and wants a court hearing with God on the matter. He'd really like to go to court with God and just say, what is going on with me? I did this and this. God, you did this. What did I do wrong? Or what am I missing here? Job wants to have God defend his actions. Ironically, it is Satan's accusation of God that got Job in this mess. <clears throat> now 
Next paragraph. In the meantime, Job's friends keep coming at him with his traditional understanding of the day. Remember the principle of retribution? To make some sense out of life, Job must have done something wrong. If he did not, then we're all in trouble. That means that God could bring all kinds of cursing on us, even when we're innocent. So you see how fast they have to hold of this principle? It'll all fall apart if it doesn't hold true all the time. Ah, keep that in mind. It's not really falling apart. Here we go. Here's something they did in the ancient world. Confession of unknown sin or uncommitted crimes was used as a way of appeasing a deity. So this is what Job's friends urge him to do. Now, this is, this is what this says. Appeasing a de deity is well saying we're going to try to please him. We're going to try to satisfy the God uh, by doing something for him. So he will lessen his wrath. So what they say do is confess your sin. Just confess it. You don't even know what it is, but just confess that you did something. Or an uncommitted crime, that you did something. Job doesn't want to do that. Last sentence, notice. Or last two sentences, Job will not do it. He will not play that game with God, and in this way, he maintains his integrity. He's not going to pretend he's guilty just so his friends will get off his back or make them feel like they're right because he knew he was righteous. Now you see what he's doing? He's holding the line to his integrity. We have many opportunities to do that in this life where we're tempted to compromise. Hold to your integrity. It always pays off. Job had no interest in confessing something he did not do to appease God. He did not see God or himself that way. This again demonstrates the purity of Job's righteousness. The interlude of chapter 28 brings us to the hymn to wisdom. It suggests that true wisdom has not spoken yet. In other words, you haven't heard the whole story. The hymn portrays God as the founder and possessor of wisdom. Human wisdom has not helped in this situation. That's human wisdom. It is found insufficient. It lacks. One can only get true wisdom from the Lord, grounded in the fear of the Lord. And this leads to the discourse section. Next paragraph at the top. The final discourse contains the final case made by Job. He makes his case. He recalls his high position, chapter 29, laments his current distress, chapter 30, and most significantly, he takes an oath of innocence, chapter 31. This oath is intended to prompt God to act. That would be like, God, here's my oath of innocence. You can check it. You can let up on the suffering now. If Job is, if Job is guilty, then then God should enact the appropriate curses. In other words, if Job had done this, then he should really get the curses. But the continued silence of God would then seem to vindicate Job. So Job, uh, God doesn't act on those curses. So what we have here is by silence, it seems like Job's doing okay. Well, this is a complicated part. Maybe your parents can explain that, explain that to you if you read it. The second discourses comprises the speeches of Elihu. We learn about Elihu. Now, like I said, Elihu is kind of a, well, today he might be in his mid-20s. He's studying in graduate school. He's not one of the old graduates like uh, Bildad and Zophar, those guys. It keeps the reader in suspense about how God will respond to Job's oath and offers more sophisticated response to Job's problem than his friends. In other words, Elihu's going to go a little deeper than his friends did. Well, Elihu insists that God governs justly. Okay, we all accept that. This agrees with the other friends but refutes Job because Job thinks something's not right here with what God's doing. He has been showing doubts about God's justice. So he agrees with his friends... That is Job's friends, but not with Job. 
Elihu accepts the retribution principle, but rejects its corollary. Now, its corollary was the principle that was related to it, and that was righteous always prosper, wicked always suffer. That's the corollary. In other words, that's a principle that comes from that main principle. All right, remember, righteous always prosper, and the wicked always suffer. In his view, suffering may be preventative as well as punitive. Now, what this means is God may have you suffer to prevent you from doing something. Right? It's like you said, Mom and Dad, I'm going to go out and do this. And you said, no, you're not. And they come and spank you. But I haven't done it. You see? I said, well, this will stop you from doing it. Well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But that's preventative as well as punitive. Now, here's, here's what Elihu thinks. Perhaps Job, now follow this one. Perhaps Job has not committed anything wrong, but may have been on that course. And this is God's way of turning him from it before he does. This would make suffering an act of mercy by God. You know, sometimes you make plans to do something and uh, something stops you. Um, we were supposed to go to a wedding at the end of this month. Well, because of the coronavirus, it's been postponed. We didn't postpone it. The people are going to have the wedding. Well, they had to postpone it because you can't go to these type of things under these conditions. Sometimes God stops us from doing something that we had, and we had nothing to do with stopping it ourselves. We had to do it. We got sick. We couldn't attend. Uh, there was a traffic accident on the freeway. We couldn't get past the traffic, and we missed everything. Okay? You had to work late at work or lose your job. There's all sorts of things. And this could have stopped you from getting in trouble. Had you not been stopped by that traffic accident, maybe you'd have been the one in the accident down the freeway, you see? Next paragraph, let's get it to the top. Elihu's view is difficult to counter. That is, you can't hardly go against it. And that is, and it is partially confirmed in God's statement about it in Job 48. But we know Elihu has not properly understood God's situation because we know that because we know what went on in the prologue, and Elihu does not. Even Elihu doesn't know what went on between God and Satan about Job. He's just making his best judgment on this. Then we come to the third discourse, which God is God's speeches. Here we expect to find a resolution to the problem. In other words, we expect it to be solved. And we do, we get real serious insight about what's going on and why the righteous Job is suffering. We see God ignored Job's complaint in his oath of innocence. Remember, Job took that oath of innocence. This is something we might expect God of God, but again, this shows us that God has his way of doing things. God doesn't cater to people, unless he has a good reason to. He doesn't give in to people unless he has a good reason to. God never indicates, we're down here now, any offense by Job or why he's suffering. The discussion is turned from God's justice to his wisdom. This is crucial. This explains it. This explains why the righteous suffer. It's in the wisdom of God. Now, here we get into a bunch of questions. God raises a bunch of questions. There are several rhetorical questions showing that God cannot be disputed. God's wisdom is seen in him as creator and Lord. God is responsible for both creation and sustaining it. If you haven't read that part yet, it's a whole bunch of questions like, can you, well, I'm going to make up the questions, but it's very similar. Can you set the sun and the sky? Did you set the boundaries of the oceans? Did you 
feed the cattle of the world today? And you're sitting there thinking, well, of course not, of course not. God did. So what makes you think you can understand his wisdom entirely? You see? Next paragraph. God shows that the retribution principle that so many have adopted is not always the way of the world. Now, what I mean by that is, keep reading, there are so many exceptions in nature and in life, but when it does operate, it shows evidence that God intervenes. Look, God feeds all the animals, right? But not all animals get fed. Some starve. Some get eaten. But you see, that eaten animal was food for the animal that ate it. So you say, well, where's the principle of righteous and all that? Well, it's in the wisdom of God. This is the way God created the heavens and the earth and the creatures. Now you have to give that some thought. Next paragraph. From God's speeches, we should learn that God's justice is dispensed through his wisdom. It's a key term, dispensed. In other words, God, when he pours out his fairness, it comes from his wisdom. And his wisdom knows a lot more than we do. One cannot deduce, that means fully understand, why people suffer from just observing observation and no one has enough wisdom to call God's justice into question. So even though you see someone righteous really suffer, you say, he was such a good guy. Why did he have to go through that cancer? Or why did he lose his wife? Or why was his, his house hit by the tornado? Whatever it is, God has his reason. Next paragraph at the top, we do learn that Job is not completely innocent. Now, this is kind of interesting. He does have a streak of self-righteousness in him. Though he generally maintained his integrity and righteousness, his questioning of God demonstrated self-righteousness in that he believed his righteousness superseded any reason for him to suffer. In other words, Job thought he was so right, and he was right, that he thought it was above God's wisdom. And that's where he showed his self-righteousness. That's often the case that people who have a streak of self-righteousness, they don't understand the older, more mature believer and why he does what he does. But they should accept it, that that person knows what he's doing. Well, that's one of the things that Paul teaches about the immature and the mature believer. Uh, there's some real conflict sometime between the two because the mature has to watch out not to offend the immature, and the immature has to be careful about challenging the mature. And he sometimes needs to defer to his greater wisdom. Okay. Self-righteousness can be a hidden weakness among the most righteous people. Job just did not think he could be wrong on this, but his depth of knowledge of the wisdom of God is limited. He didn't know everything about God. The epilogue draws the matter to a close. Job gets back to his prosperity. He gets it back, but it's not without a good reason. Though Satan is not in the epilogue, we don't read about Satan again, it, is, it does show that God still blesses who he wants and whether he wants. God does bless the righteous and curse the wicked after all. Job's friends are rebuked, but not for accusing Job, but because they did not properly speak of God. Though they were not condemned, but they were short-sighted, neither did they understand God's wisdom. God had a greater reason for Job suffering than the one that seemed most plausible. Something beyond their thinking. I'm going to read this kind of fast. Job never receives an, a specific explanation for his suffering, but he is vindicated. He had lived a righteous life as he claimed. Why Job was suffering was not the ultimate issue. It wasn't about Job. The issue was God's justice being dispensed through his wisdom. 
God was first and foremost dealing with Satan and showing him that God's principle of retribution was just. We often do not know why God does what he does. We can question it. We can say things like, God works things together for good. God is wiser than us. God always knows what he's doing. And those things are true. But we really haven't a clue why God does many things. Many are guesses. We just guess at it. The book lets us know at the beginning why Job was suffering and that he was really righteous. So much of the criticism from his friends was unfounded. We saw how it affected Job and then how his suffering was starting to get to him and his questioning of God. Job was pushed to the limit. God did not let this experience go too far and destroy him. Job did maintain his integrity. He did not go out and start reveling in sin, just doing anything he wants, saying, what's the use of living righteous if I'm going to suffer like this? No. Job maintained his righteousness, his life, his righteous life, and God vindicated him by restoring his prosperity. He gets everything back at the end. His friends would have seen this restoration and probably think Job must have confessed his wrongdoing and that they were right. But that would be presumptuous. That means they assumed something that wasn't true. They truly did not, nor did Job, fully comprehend that God's justice is dispensed through wisdom. It was only revealed to the reading audience why Job suffered. Let's look at some major themes. The retribution principle. The principle is that one suffers or prospers according to his conduct before God. This is the basic principle assumed in the arguments in Job. The related principle states that if a person is righteous, he prospers. If he is wicked, he suffers. This view was and is even popular a popular notion today. It seems to explain why some do so well and others do not. The Israelites widely accepted these principles as well, but included God in it. God blesses you when righteous and curses when wicked. A problem arose when the theory did not match up with experiences, which is what we see in the book of Job. In Job, everyone assumed this retribution principle. The question arises when one sees what one sees does not match with the principle like when the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer so job's situation did not fit so there must be a hidden sin but we know that was not the case so i just kind of went over some of the stuff we went over earlier going to the structure and explaining it this is the principle explained let's look at some practical applications do not try and judge people based on their prosperity or lack of it. Now, get this down. Just because they're poor doesn't mean they're bad people. They may be wonderful, godly people. And the other way around, if they're rich, they may be wicked as can be. They may be drug dealers. Who knows? Another principle, do not demand that God act based upon just your limited knowledge of something or someone. Only God knows. Don't tell God to go curse someone. That person may be doing exactly what God wants. Or God may be using them in a way he doesn't know it. Next principle, right here. Do the right thing and leave the consequences in God's hands. Final principle, everyone, everything is always in the sovereign control of God who loves us. Don't ever forget that. How many times have we thought God would do something one way and then it turns out totally different? A way we could have never guessed. The next major principle here, theme, wisdom, justice, and the sovereignty of God. Now this is a really important one. Wisdom, justice, and the sovereignty of God are emphasized in the book of Job and wisdom literature. Now listen carefully. Wisdom is usually not listed as an attribute of God. If you study the character of God, wisdom is not one of those characters. We speak of omniscience instead of wisdom. Yet it is wisdom that puts that omniscience into action. 
It is God's greater wisdom that knows what is best, what works things out for good to those who love him. Linked to that is omnipotence, that's his power. It is by being all-powerful, all-powerful, that God can work things out and do what is best. Sovereignty is what we should be seeing here. That is his control of everything. Sovereignty is often listed as an attribute, as justice, or just. God is always just, always perfectly fair. Now, here's where we get to the heart of the explanation of the book, this next paragraph. The book of Job brings in the deeper principle that justice is dispensed according to God's all-knowing wisdom. Well, what I mean by dispensed, when it comes to the great wisdom of God and justice, God uses great wisdom in administering justice. You might wonder, and we, of course you study this in the Old Testament, why this wicked nation punished Israel. And Israel was God's people. Because Israel had been bad and they needed punished, and God used a bad nation to do it. And then, not long afterwards, he destroys that bad nation. But he used them to, to discipline Israel, you see. Next paragraph. These attributes of God work together to carry out his sovereign will. It is often his will that we do not know why things happen. Did you hear that? It is often his will that we do not know why many things happen. The death of a child, the Holocaust, the suffering of so many in different parts of the world. I heard recently that some two million people have starved already in just the first um, four months or so, three or four months of this year. This is 2020. This lack of understanding should cause us to look to the character of God when we don't understand his ways. We know by faith that God is perfectly just, wise, and sovereign. We accept that by faith. Mediator. Well, you know something about a mediator. That's someone who's the go-between. Several times in the book, there were indicators that Job wanted and might even receive a mediator to help him with his case before God. Let me just read through these rather rapidly. Job 9.33, he says, There is no umpire between us who may lay his hand upon us both. O earth, do not cover my blood, and let there be no resting place for my cry. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and my advocate is on high. An advocate is someone who stands in for you like a lawyer in a courtroom. Verse 21 Oh, that a man might plead with God as a man with his neighbor. 3323, if there is an angel as mediator for him, one out of a thousand. So maybe an angel can come in and help me with God. It is as if Job wanted someone to go to God on his behalf and plead his case. That God had maybe missed something. But in the end, God himself steps back in, never explaining why Job suffered, but making everything appear right and just. Now let me just say this. You may never know why something happens in your life. Maybe when you get to heaven, you can ask God. I don't know if he'll answer you or not. You probably won't care by then. But just remember, God's wise. Last paragraph, God himself is our kinsman redeemer. He makes things right. He, We need to make sure we are patient enough and wise enough to remember that God is always just. So if we suffer and we're righteous, maybe you'll lose a parent when you're young or your parents divorced or separated. And that hurts. That hurts. You remember that God allowed that and God still loves you, and that God is going to work in your life so you can accomplish what he wants you to. Just understand that we don't always understand God, but he is wise, and he is just, 
And when he acts in his wisdom, he's always going to be just. It's just that we don't always understand it. And that we accept by faith. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word today. It's been a very challenging one at that. We ask that we'll take these things and apply them in our life in the power of the Spirit so we can better understand our life, but even more so, know you. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.